I'm really, really super excited to invite this speaker tonight. Rob Hopkins has been a huge inspiration to me. He's been very influential. He's written these two amazing books. If you're looking for something good to read, um, From What Is to What If and The Power of Just Doing Stuff. And Rob, I'd like you to sign them personal message, please, tonight. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you really have transformed my life. I've done a lot in my local community because of listening to you speak and you sharing the stories that you've galvanized from around the world and that you've kind of been very instrumental in making happen. Um, so I won't steal any more of your story. I will let you take the floor and take us on a journey of inspiration. Thanks very much, Rob Hopkins, over to you. Thank you, Laura, thank you so much. And, uh, <clears throat> um... And you're very, very inspiring yourself, uh, uh, Laura. And and it's lovely to to be here with you all. And it's so great that this initiative is happening. And I really want to salute everybody who who is making this uh, making this happen. And I'm just going to share my screen because I want to share uh, uh, some pictures with you to illustrate what I'm going to say. So um, I want to talk about tonight. The, the imagination and why it feels like it's so vitally important when we talk about climate change uh, in these conversations. And uh, so to, to start to give a little bit of context, I'm Rob, I live in South Devon and in a town called Totnes. And in Totnes in 2006, we started something that was really an experiment that became called Transition, the, the, the Transition Movement. We started something called Transition Town Totnes, really just as something to see if there was a way that we could do bottom-up uh, action around climate change and, and in our community, and very quickly it started spreading and spreading and spreading, and there are now transition groups in 50 countries around the world, in thousands of communities. It's about what we can do, where we are, with what we have, the people that we have, the resources that we have, and groups do all kinds of things. And I'll tell you some stories as we go along, but just to set a bit of a frame, they might do small things like organizing tree planting events or uh, <clears throat> um, working with their local schools or seed exchanges to more ambitious things like creating community energy companies. There are some very ambitious community energy projects happening now, uh, local currency projects, all sorts of things up to some of the more ambitious things I'm going to talk about. So somebody once called the transition movement hope with its sleeves rolled up which is which I really really like and that's something that's kind of a spirit that I hope I might be able to convey uh, this evening so just to set the context which I'm sure you all get it's why you're here we are in a climate and ecological emergency you know I've studied sustainability in university in the mid 90s I've read about it passionately ever since I kind of feel like everything all the books I have on my shelf on this subject that were written before about 2018 are pretty much of no use anymore because this is just accelerating now so quickly this summer we saw a temperature of 41 degrees here in this country way ahead of anything that was expected to be happening quite so fast 100 towns in France ran out of water uh, in Pakistan 30 million people were displaced 35 percent of the no 30 percent of the country was underwater 35 million people displaced in a country responsible for less than one percent of climate change and this is really something where the urgency is 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 acute and um the way i always like to approach it is based on the work of somebody called david holmgren who was one of the people who created permaculture uh which is a subject for another talk at another time but it's with that it's he he said that where we go from here is there are four different places we go there's what he called techno explosion which is people who still imagine we can all just go and live on mars and that somehow you know we'll mine the minerals we need off asteroids or something techno stability which is this kind of idea that we can maintain a growth-based uh economy but we just have run it all on solar panels and, uh, and you know, it's like a green energy, green growth kind of a model, which just doesn't fit within the physics of what nature is calling for. Uh, or there's collapse, which a lot of people are talking about now. I spend a lot of time in conversations with people who now think, well, the collapse of everything is completely inevitable. My work has always really focused on this, on the light blue path here, which is that there is a way that we can massively reduce 
the levels of consumption, that we can move away from the kind of growth based high fossil fuel way of doing it to a different way of doing things, which is more local, more resilient, more based on well-being uh, and community and connection. And that that offers a way that we can move towards a, a lower carbon society really quickly. And the thinking of the transition movement has always been we will only do that if it feels like a move towards something irresistible and delicious and magnificent, rather than feeling like we're being dragged away from something that's completely irreplaceable. So in effect, we designed the transition movement as a kind of detox for the global north, because we're the problem here, and we need to change our expectations and change our cultural stories. The Institute for the Future in the US they have this great saying on their window, any useful statement about the future should at first seem ridiculous. I think we have reached a point now after decades of procrastination on, on, on the climate crisis where anything, any policy put forward, any action put forward on the climate, on, on tackling this that doesn't initially seem at least a bit ridiculous is probably not ambitious enough. The time for little incremental little steps is completely behind us now. We need really bold uh, reimagining of things. I love uh, the the work of like music declares who are who are getting artists now to say we'll only tour if we can travel by train. Uh, and I loved recently I was reading about uh, uh, Inez Fitzgerald who's a, who's a, who's said that she won't go to the junior world championships in Australia because it involves flying. This you know we 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 have to scale up our ambitious our ambition hugely. And so when I do talks, I often say to people, please, in the conversations you have about the climate emergency. Don't, you know, be as ridiculous as you can. Don't be worried about, well, I, this, people might think this is a bit silly. This is really a time, I think, for really bold and ambitious ideas. And this is a picture from the US in the late 60s, when, when people went to the beach, they just parked their car on the beach. That was just how it was. Everybody went to the car. The beaches looked like this. That was how it was. Shortly after this picture was taken, something must have changed where because it doesn't look like this anymore. And you, but you can guarantee, and I think we can all agree that it's much nicer now going to the beach and it not looking like this. But you can guarantee there will have been people who said, but I can't imagine going to the beach and not parking my car on the beach. The fact that people, some people can't imagine something is no reason why we shouldn't do that thing. And recently, the UN published a report where they said any chance of staying below one and a half degrees is now finished unless we see a rapid transformation of society. So all the magazine articles, all the newspapers ran with headlines like this. 1.5 is finished. I didn't see a single magazine front page or article that said, that rapid transformation of society thing sounds quite good. How could we do that? It's not like it's working amazingly as it is anyway. Why don't we go for that option rather than the saying goodbye to 1.5 degree option? And so what I want to, to, to really talk about with you this evening is that for me it feels like we're only going to do that if we can cultivate longing in society in people for a different kind of a future and at the moment quite often <clears throat> we see this image almost as the sort of the banner of the climate movement this is on the front cover of Greta Thunberg's new book you see it in many places every every stripe represents the average year temperature of a year and uh, and it and it tells a really grim story. I think this is a terrible banner to mobilize a movement around because as a story, it's it you it doesn't you, you can't really cultivate any longing around that. I always wonder if maybe we should make this the banner of the climate movement because that's something that I would uh, that I long for so deeply is to live in my lifetime to see that or something like that, that kind of change in direction. And I, and I sometimes people say, yeah, but Rob, that's not going to happen. And I say, well, you know, when I was in my garden kicking a football around, uh, you know, I, I and I would dream that I would score the winning goal in the FA Cup final. It was never going to happen. But actually, you know, actually, the, the more you can create a story that that, that 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 draws us towards it, the more likely we have, likely we have of 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 changing the direction of that of that curve. The problem I think we have is that in 2023, we're living in a time where our collective imagination, which should be a muscle like this, because we can only rebuild the world, reimagine the world if we if our imaginations are strong enough for that. Our currently our imagination muscle is kind of like this. 
we've created a perfect storm of factors that are deeply undermining our collective ability to reimagine things. Mariame Kaber, an amazing activist in America, she says, we live in a system that has been locked into a false sense of inevitability. And um, this was research that showed that imagination and IQ had risen together till the mid 90s, and then IQ kept rising and imagination started to decline. And that really, really matters. Because if we can't see beyond what's in front of us, if all of the organizations that should be making that change can't see beyond just carrying on doing what they've always done, we have a real, real problem on our hands. So for me, a lot of the work I do is about how do we cultivate and nurture longing for a low carbon very different kind of a future one way is with art this is an amazing artist called james mckay he works at the university of leeds communicating science in very kind of visual ways this is his picture when he says okay what would our cities look like if they became the most biodiverse places they could be if we decided in 2023 okay we're going to make london leeds bristol the most biodiverse places they could be what might they, what might they be like in 10 years time a picture like this you can almost smell what that place would be like we need to be bringing this alive for people in their imaginations the poet rilke once said the future we, uh, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens which is so beautiful, I'm going to say it twice. The future must enter into you a long time before it happens. How do we make people's experience of our activism, of sporting events, of community events, work in that way? This is his picture where he says, more and more cities now are taking space away from cars. We have to do that. We saw this summer that when temperatures get above 38, 39 degrees, concrete and tarmac kill people. And we need to be taking that up. What else could we do in that space? Our kids could walk to school through gardens like this. This is entirely possible if we can cultivate the longing for that in our society. One of the challenges that we have is that the spaces that we walk around in today look like this. This is Fleet Street in London. It doesn't really inspire you to, to think of it as being anything other than this. But maybe this might help. And I think when I look at that version of London, I think, God, what jobs are people doing in that London? How is how loud is the bird song in that version of London? What's mental health like? You know, and we get so used to any of those of you who've seen The Handmaid's Tale will know in that kind of dystopian storytelling, they do it brilliantly where they take really iconic places in America and create dystopian versions of it. We very rarely do it the other way around to give people a taste of, of what we could still create. And I think using technology like that really, really helps. So the thing that I want to share with you this evening is something that came out of when I was writing from what is to what if. Uh, there was a guy who was renting a room in my house who was studying at Schumacher College, and he based his dissertation on the manuscript of the book and tried to pull out the essence of it. And together we created this thing that we call the imagination sundial. The idea of the imagination sundial is to say, if our collective imagination muscle is like this and it needs to be like this, how do we do it? What are the levers that we can pull to make that happen? And at the end, I'll give you a link where you can download this and you don't have to do like Laura's trying to do now going cross-eyed reading the tiny writing around the edge you can read it you can have it in high definition pdf and read it all in its magnificence but I'm just going to go through the four of these things and, and tell you some stories so the first one is space so you will know that the times when you are at your most imaginative is when you have some space and uh uh so Albert Einstein always said he got his best ideas when he rode his bicycle in the forest. J.K. Rowling thought of the whole Harry Potter story on a long train journey from Glasgow down to London. You know, th that kind of daydreamy space is so, so important. And if in our organizations, in our movements, in our sports clubs, whatever, we don't make intentionally make that space too explicitly reimagine them they're just going to carry on as they as, as they always do this is in my town just before covid this kind of big community reimagining events with really good facilitation is something the transition movement does really really well extinction rebellion does really well as well they're so important because if we don't do them nobody else really does them and we need to come together and think okay what what are the opportunities that are here so creating that space is really important this is one of my favorite stories 
about this, but also about space in two ways. I just love this story and I always love telling it. In Zambia in 1964, which had just become independent after decades of, of British colonial rule, there was a man called Edward Makuka Unkoloso, who had been a fighter in the Zambian Liberation Army, who announced to the world that, uh, that uh, this is when America and Russia were competing to get the first man on the moon. He announced the Zambian space program and said, no, no, the first person on the moon is gonna be a young woman from Zambia and we're building a rocket. And I love this newspaper article at the time. It says, rocket a bit wobbly. And he wrote letters to, to governments all around the world asking them for money. Nobody sent him anything. He set up a training station for his astronauts kind of out in the middle of nowhere. This is him training them for weightlessness in space by rolling them down a hill in an empty oil drum. And he would also swing them on a rope. And then when they got to the top, cut the rope so they experienced about a second of weightlessness before they presumably then fell down and hurt themselves rather badly. And uh, he uh, he was very ambitious. He also was planning a mission to Mars. Uh, they were going to take two cats and a missionary to Mars. Uh, but he said, but I have warned the missionary he must not force Christianity on the people of Mars if they do not want it, which I think was a nice touch. The, the thing with the cats was that they were going to arrive and open the door and then put the cat outside and to see if the air was breathable on Mars. But I don't think he'd quite thought through either the whole thing of opening the door and quite how much cat food you'd have to take and how that would affect your ability to take off. But anyway, so at the time, everybody thought Edward was completely bonkers and all the newspaper articles at the time portray him as a complete fruitcake. And then, but then when he died in 1989, he was buried with the highest honors the Zambian government could give to their citizens. Because what he did in that newly independent nation, just finding its feet in the world, was to say, why shouldn't the first person on the moon be from Zambia? Actually, we could do that. We could be that. That's absolutely within our realm of what's possible. And most people had forgotten his story. And in 2014, a photographer called Christina de Medel made a beautiful series of photos that she called Afronauts, which kind of reconnected people to Edward's story. I was going to show you a couple of them because they're really beautiful, I think. So I, I think that ability to hold really big, brave, ambitious stories is something we have become much, much uh, better at, which, again, is why I love the idea of, uh, you know, people starting to not go to tournaments because it involves flying. You know, I, I was convinced that this would be the World Cup that uh, would have to be cancelled because nobody could afford to get there. Uh, but I think, you know, we, we have to be reimagining things quite ambitiously, I think. And creating space for reimagining. This is a, in Cambridge, the Cambridge Imaginarium, which pops up every now and then in, in empty units in shopping centres, inviting people to come in and share their dreams. Sometimes those imagining spaces can be mobile this is something created in my town called chrysalis which is a mobile imagination space a kind of cabinet of curiosities that can be turned into a cinema a classroom all kinds of different things we need these spaces that invite people to think differently the second part uh, part of the sundial is place and what i mean by place is a place that you go to and what you see and you feel and you experience there means that when you come back home again, you see your home place and its possibilities through very different eyes. And I'm sure you've all had places like this. This is Waterloo Bridge in London in April 2019. Some of you were there, I'm sure. And um, I wasn't, but I know a lot about it. Well, I visited it at the end, but my wife was there the whole time. She was she's very involved with Extinction Rebellion. She's been arrested seven times already. I'm very proud of her. And uh, what happened during that week was during those two weeks was that the bridge was turned into a forest. They put trees all down, all down the bridge. And um, people who would cross that bridge every day, normally full of traffic, would stop and say, oh, why can't it be like this all the time? And I like to think of it as a pop up tomorrow. And I've met at least three people who were working in the city around this and who that experience of standing on that bridge and seeing that was what prompted them to give up their jobs and get involved in, in, in sustainability. And this idea of a pop up tomorrow where people can see and smell and taste and experience what that future would be like, I think is something that we have barely tapped the potential of doing that, taking a place people know really well and 
transforming it into how it could be. Recently, uh, in, in April uh, last year, a group of activists rewilded Trafalgar Square for one day as a kind of a uh, as a sort of an, an educational thing about rewilding. What would it look like if Trafalgar Square was rewilded? Where are the places that you have access to that you could overnight transform them into something really different that would give people a taste of a very different kind of a future? Uh, one of the things that I love doing in, in the work that I do, which is, as I said before, is really focused on this idea of how do we cultivate longing for a different future, is to go to places in the world that already sound like that future will need to sound like. It's a project called Field Recordings from the Future, because most of the things that we know, that we know we need to do already exist somewhere. And if you had a time machine and you could travel to 2030 and you could record what a car free London sounded like and you could bring those recordings back to people in 2022 and play them to people and say, this is what it's going to sound like. How does that affect your your willingness to fight for that and your belief that it's possible? So I go to visit places. This is a place in Germany, in Freiburg, called the Vauban, which is the biggest car free neighborhood in Europe. It's awesome place all the buildings are very very energy efficient uh, lots of renewable energy it's a car free neighborhood with 3000 people um and loads of trees and gardens and it's just a permaculture paradise it's fantastic more cargo bikes than i've ever seen in one place and i spent two days there just recording what does it sound like? And I went there thinking, well, I know what it's going to sound like. It'll sound like bicycles going past and it'll sound like children in the street. Actually, the things that you don't expect are the most interesting, because when it's that quiet, you can hear people having piano lessons in their house when you walk around. You can hear because it's such a pleasant place to be. People bring their food, bring their food and sit on the balcony to eat their food because the air smells really nice, not of car smoke. So one of the things you hear as you walk around in the evening is loads of knives and forks on plates uh, as you walk around. So I'm just going to play you a little one minute recording of recordings that I made in the Vauban. So you might like to just close your eyes and imagine that you're in the place that you live in 2030, where cars are something that people have a have a vague memory of, but they're not something that's a, a factor of daily life anymore, because it could sound like this. Can you not hear it? Oh, you should have told me earlier. There was me sitting there in my reverie. Uh, hang on a second. I'll have to do that again then. I thought I'd kick the little box. Oh, I'm so sorry. What an amateur. Let's try that again. Okay. Close your eyes. <laughs> and Laura, if it doesn't work this time, tell me sooner, please. Okay. So hopefully this will, this will now work. Thank you for time traveling with me to 2030. Um, so I go to visit places like this is in Utrecht in Holland, which has the biggest bicycle rush hour in the world. 33,000 people cycle into the center of Utrecht every morning. Uh, and they have a car park, bike, like underground bike parking spaces for about 25,000 bikes. Normally, when you cycle into a city, you get those signs that tell you how many car parking spaces there are. In Utrecht, it's for bicycles. It was just absolutely phenomenal. So I went there to record the bicycle rush hour. Uh, I went to Cornwall to record uh, a beaver rewilding project. I'm so in love with beavers. Uh, you know, I think all of this that we can do just to help people 
feel into and imagine what we could still create is is absolutely important so uh as well in terms of in terms of uh, places sports have a really important role to play in this as well and i love the work that uh, forest green rovers are doing in terms of how that how that everything in how that club runs is about sustainability and educating people about sustainability how their pitch runs how their how their costumes are made or where the food comes from the new stadium that they're building uh, you know the, the 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 role that that sporting organizations have to make this stuff the new normal i remember visiting a transition group in london who'd started an amazing new food market and I said, why do you do this? And they said, because we want our children to grow up thinking this is normal. And I think there's so much, that, that everything that we can do to, 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 to bring a different future alive in people's lived experience is absolutely fundamental. The third bit of this is practices. So things that we do together that allow us to exercise our collective imagination. And this is a, a, a guy who I just love so much, a guy called Sun Ra, who was a jazz musician in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. And Sun Ra, firstly, if you've never heard Sun Ra, go and listen to some Sun Ra. It's extraordinary. Sun Ra told an amazing story about himself. He said, I am another order of being. I'm not from this planet. I'm an angel from Saturn. And with my band, we travel through space. And this was in, in the late 60s. He was talking about space travel as a different way of talking about black liberation than people like the Black Panthers were talking about it. The thing about Sun Ra that I really, really loved is he would dress like this, not as a stage act. He would dress like this and all of his band would just to go to the laundrette or to go down the corner shop to buy some milk. And I read a book about him recently that described him as being an everyday utopian. He once said, we've tried the possible and it failed. Now it's time to try the impossible. And I feel like that idea of, of, of living as an everyday utopian feels so powerful to me. And uh, a while ago, I was reading an article about the Black Lives Matter protest in Washington in 2020. And I saw this woman who was wearing this T-shirt. I've been to the future. We won. I've been to the future. We won. It gave me goosebumps when I saw it and I thought how different is our activism if every time we have those really important conversations that we need to have with people about the climate emergency and how urgent this is that rather than just talking about collapse and extinction we also share with them what it is about the future that we could still create that we really really long for that we share that with people I long to live in a city where the rivers are so clean that people swim to work I long to live in a city where the bird song is louder than the traffic. You know, how do we, th that feels like something that is so, so missing from, 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 from a lot of the activism that we do. So this is a project that I'm involved with, this Field Recordings from the Future project. It's a music project I'm doing, working with a, an amazing um, musical artist called Mr. Kit. And we're currently working with this fantastic cartoonist called Thomas Liera to create a sort of a graphic novel of our trips to 2030. And what we saw there, that's me on the, on the left there with the beavers and the mushrooms. And, uh, and I think we need to find lots of different ways. There's a guy called Gregory Clays who just wrote a book called Utopianism on a Dying Planet, who says in there, he said, only the extraordinary can save us. And I feel like we need to be bringing in artistic things and playful things and music and, and rather than just all the things that we think we should be doing. And this is uh, one of, the, I think, one of the most important things happening at the moment, which is a friend of mine called Phoebe Tickell, who does a lot of work as well around imagination, has designed and, and just finished running for the first time and is about to start for the second time, running with Camden Council in London, who were the first local council in this country to declare a climate emergency, the first one to do a citizens' assembly on climate change. She has designed and run an imagination activist training with 42 members of staff uh, in Camden Council. And, and then it's been running again soon with senior management. And she's designing it in such a way that it can roll out through, through different organizations. I feel like every organization should be training people within that organization to be the imagination activists, to be the people who bring the what if questions, to be the people who speak out uh, for for the possibilities and who are, and who are not afraid of being seen as being ridiculous and that we and that that's and I keep saying to her this needs to happen everywhere how do we how do we 
and how do we maximize and roll this thing out everywhere because i think it's so 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 important and i went up for the last day uh, of this training and it was extraordinary the journey that she had taken them on and to be in a room with 42 people senior people in a major london local authority who were talking like uh, who, who rather than saying this is what we need to do we should introduce this policy we're saying it's now 2030 we've had this policy for the last five years how has it changed how has Camden different you know who were able to project themselves into that future rather than just sitting in the present and talking about how terrible it is and how hopeless uh, it all is so a couple of projects that I've seen at the community scale that I've really, really loved. This is something called the Sheffield Wheat Project, which uh, the Sheffield Wheat Experiment, which has been running for a couple of years now in Sheffield. And it's about the, it's on the surface, it's a community project about getting people to grow a small patch of wheat, one, two square meters of wheat. Uh, and then everybody brings them together on a harvest day in Sheffield. And then they all, uh, whatever you do, it, um, winnow it and, and thresh it and, that thing you uh, there's all different words that i can't remember but the, the learning again what it takes to actually make bread what's happening underneath this project is that they are trying to create a, what's called a land race a sheffield variety of wheat that is uniquely suited to sheffield and its soils and its culture and its and its climate that then is such a key part of building a more resilient food structure so every every food system so every year they 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 grow some wheat they keep the most of it to, for then sowing again next year and they make some bread with it then the next year they have more and so they make more bread but they also have more and they're building out every year these varieties of wheat these are kind of things that we can be doing at a community scale that are that build community that bring people together that can bring artists together with all kinds of different people but they're also creating a really fundamentally important piece uh, of community resilience this is in wellington in somerset transition town wellington are fantastic and they've started all kinds of uh, plantings of, of food forests uh, around Wellington. They started with a small one. Then they did a, an, an acre strip behind some people's houses. This is a, an eight acre field that they run a big community consultation for and are now planting up as a food forest. And then about a few months ago, their local council said, uh, we've got this 35 acre strip around the edge of the town. Could you create a green corridor with us? So often when we are involved in climate change, with the word pod, the words pod positive feedback tend to not be very positive at all they tend to be things getting worse and worse but we see positive feedbacks in community activism as well where they build and they build and uh, and i think it's really important to to, to connect with that, that kind of action as well and one of the practices that's so important i think is the ability to ask a really good what if question and what i mean by that is a question that's that starts with what if a good what if question is like a it's like an Alice in Wonderland where she wants to get through the little door, but she's too big, but she really, really wants to get in there. And um, so uh, this is in Liège in Belgium. And in Liège in Belgium, about in 2014, they came up with a what if question. They said, what if in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège? I went to a big event where they launched this. And then I went back again. I don't know what that red line is that's just appeared on my screen. I don't know if you can see that. Um, uh, and in those four years, they had created, uh, they'd created 27 new cooperatives and raised 5 million euros to fund them from the people of Liège, not from the bank, not from the municipality, from the people of Liège. They started a farm, two vineyards, a brewery. I had to go and visit the brewery. You know, we all have to make sacrifices for the revolution. They started four shops in the centre of the city called the Small Producers. It's now the model the municipality is using to rethink how it supplies food to schools and universities and hospitals. It's a model that's now spreading uh, across Belgium to six other cities. The mayor of Liège recently made me an honorary citizen of Liège because he said until recently, Recently, everybody thought Liège was a bit crap. And actually, now you go around the world telling everyone how great Liège is, and uh, you're kind of an ambassador of Liège. So, uh, so, and and it's now spreading into France. This is now the future of how of how our cities are going to feed themselves. But it came from a community with a really great what if question. So, the last little piece of pack of of our um, sundial, and then I'm going to hand back to Laura, is pacts. And what I mean by pacts is that for so many of us in the world today, we get used to our imaginations being a bit patronised, 
sort of patted on the head sort of token consultations where we go along and it's not really a consultation they've already decided what they're going to do and we all write our great ideas on post-it notes and then go home and nothing really changes and I think after a while if our of our imaginations being invited and ignored they slowly start to kind of desiccate and disappear and what we need to do is to give people an experience of well we imagined that and look it happened now what can we do so this is in Bologna in Italy, where the municipality noticed in 2012 a real decline of people being involved in local democracy and engagement, civic engagement. So they started something called the Civic Imagination Office, and they opened six laboratories around the city where they ran big visioning exercises like this. And what was brilliant was that at the end of them, when people had come up with really good ideas, the municipality would sit with them and say, that is a great idea. Let's make it happen. We can offer this and this and this. You can offer that. Let's make a pact. And in the last five or six years in Bologna, they've made 500 pacts between the municipality and the people. And what I think is lovely about that is it gives people that experience of being asked to do something, imagine something. They imagine it. It happens. Then you think, wow, we imagined that. What else can we do? And then you get this drawing up of imagination through society. So I feel like every organization that serves a body of people has a duty to invite their imagination and then to help make it actually uh, a reality. So that's what I wanted well, to share. With you really excuse today. me, sorry to interrupt you. I'm just wondering, can you stop and re reshare your screen? Because I think um, I think it was a mistake. Uh, someone wrote on it by accident and oh, maybe cool. reshare your screen. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I'm hoping they're gone now. Thank you. Keep going. All right, so I'm I'm nearly done. So th so that's what I wanted to share with you was the imagination sundial, and I'll and I'll tell you where you can find that in more detail. Uh, I'd be I'm always fascinated to know if it's something that people find useful in all kinds of different settings. So if it's something that you do find useful, that would be great. And um and so just to wrap up, if you want to find out anything else about what I do. Uh, there's lots of stuff at robhopkins.net. All the interviews that were done for the book are on there, for example. If you're interested in transition, transitionnetwork.org, there's a thing there called Transition Near Me. You can put your postcode. It'll tell you everything that's happening near where you live. And there's a free download of a guide there called The Essential Guide to Doing Transition, which distills 15 years of experience around the world of, of how to get this stuff started. And I do a podcast series called From What If to What Next, uh, which is... Um, comes out every two weeks and every different episode is based around a what if question and if you wanted to subscribe and support that that would be amazing and uh and i hope this has been a useful contribution to your series and thank you so much for all that you all do and i'm going to hand back to laura thank you rob that's beyond useful. Wow, what an absolutely phenomenally inspiring talk. I'm just absolutely buzzing. I hope everybody else's imaginations are just like flowing and juices are going and lots of ideas coming into your minds, perhaps. Um, yeah, a big round of applause. Thank you so much, Rob.